I'm really excited about this morning's panel. We've got a great uh, uh, bunch of panelists from a, a really diverse array of agencies. So I'm going to get right into it. The title, as you can see up there, is The Other Side of the Recession. But before we do that, I'm going to give you guys one chance to vent, and then we're going to move on <laughs> beyond the recession. So. I want each of you to, to introduce yourselves um, for the audience. Just give a, a just a quick uh, li little bit of background on, on what your agency uh, on your agency and what it does, and then tell me one thing that you hear from clients, which after the recession's over, you hope you never hear again. <laughs> Susan, let's start oh, with you. Don't start with me. Uh, I'm Susan Janino. I'm uh, chairman and CEO of Publicities Worldwide in the USA. Uh, it's a, I think most of you probably know it, a global uh, network, French-based, so I've learned a lot about working with the French, which is very interesting. <laughs> um, uh, one thing that after the recession I hope I never hear again, oh, <laughs> when do you think the recession will be over? You know, is it, is it, is it <laughs> Susan just took my answer. Um, <laughs> I'm Mike Hughes, I'm um, President and Creative Director of the Martin Agency in Virginia. <laughs> and um, I think this is a time when, um, uh, for a long time, long before the recession started, we were tired of hearing the question about, well, tell, what can I tell my CEO is the ROI for this campaign? And, and we always kind of danced around that subject and, um, because they didn't want to accept our answer when we said, we don't really know. And so we started making up answers. And now I think analytics is making it much more possible these days to answer that question. Um, and so now we are judged on results, which is, I think, very healthy and good for our, uh, for our industry. But right now, the question I'm tired of saying, I'm saying, well, if this gets you the results, and then the client comes back and says, yes, but is it on brand? Is it on brand? And, um, and I don't know if that's recession-based, but I do care about being on brand. I care about it all, as much as my client does, but um, I, I am hearing that too often. Hi, I'm Jeff King. I'm with Barclay. We're a full-service agency based in Kansas City. Uh, clients like Sonic Drive-Ins, March of Dimes, 24-Hour Fitness. I would guess the, the, the one question I would like to not hear again is pretty simple, which is, can you do everything you've done for me in the past for half as much? <laughs> <laughs> Peter McGinnis, Chairman and CEO of Gotham. Um, it's interesting when you have the creative guy talking about ROI. So <laughs> a lot has changed. Um, I think the, one of the things I would really rather not hear um, again is, um, Sorry, but we have to cut your budget. Um, I can't wait to hear that we're actually going to increase our investment. Um, that would be music to my ears. So I'm waiting. Bate of breath. Bob. I'm uh, Bob Horvath, CEO of uh, RAP. <coughs> we're a worldwide marketing agency. Um, the thing I probably don't want to hear again is how many shares of Citibank did you buy at the dollar <laughs> share? Um, so the answer is none. So. Um, no, but seriously, the I think um, uh, to Mike's point, it's it, that's kind of the continuing uh, challenge of, of, of brand versus measurement, and how do you tie the two together? And, and um, we've seen a lot of interest, obviously, in in uh, what was formerly back in the day called as you know double duty advertising, which included both measured and um, and general brand advertising. So. I think there's going to be a lot more emphasis on that convergence of, of brand-driven um, CRM-based solutions. So, so I want to dig into that <laughs> question, which you both you and, and, and Mike mentioned, which and something I think is connected to that is when you're talking about ROI, especially during a recession, you're talking about, okay, how can we advertise lower prices or sales or things that, that move the needle? And when your client comes to you, um, let's start with you, Bob. When your client comes to you and says, give me a, a promotion uh, or some work about low prices, how do you do that in a way that also builds the brand and, and uh, maintains value for, a long, for the long run beyond that? Yeah, I think, I think um, if you look at any category, I think there's typically only one low cost provider. So I think you have to get beyond the cost and get into what's the value of 
of the brand, right? What's the value of their offering? Um, we've spent a lot of time talking about the, the value of values, you know, kind of good as the new green type of thing. Um, and how do you really get into the connections of what's the most important thing for that brand or product versus uh, the customer base that they're looking to go after? So the, the analytics, the modeling, the, the um, anthropology behind how do, you, how do you develop that understanding of what's driving that consumer connection to that brand and then how do you leverage that is, is, is a very, you know, it's a very fertile ground for us. We're seeing a lot of interest in that. So you kind of take the conversation from what's the, what's the cost point, what's the um, positioning and move it more into a conversation about the, the value that is res resonates with that um, consumer. Mike, you in some ways have the, the when it comes to advertising low prices, you've got the easiest <laughs> job because your client's Walmart. Uh, so when you when you're advertising for Walmart, is it just as simple as doing just hitting that low prices again and again? And is that going to work when uh, <coughs> the economy improves and people have more disposable income? Well, that's the first time I've ever heard um, making it for Walmart was the easiest job. <laughs> 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 um, but I, what I think is right now, I think consumers are very very serious about. Um, um, not <laughs> well, being willing to pay premiums for things that have um, not hard value. And so um, your case is right. We have to often make, for, for various clients, value cases. But we also have to lean back on our clients and say, you've got to put a product that's priced right out in the market or, or else it's not going to sell. I don't care what the ad says. And so, um, and I don't know what will happen when this recession ends and it turns around how long people will stay in that mindset. But right now, um, that's where America's mindset is and uh, the world's mindset is. We're not going to pay premiums for things that don't give us hard values. And so, you know, um, whether we're selling car insurance for Geico or uh, um, anything else in the world for Walmart, um, we have to make sure that the point comes through clearly again and again and again that you're not trading down, you're getting a product that's just as good as. Mm -hmm. um, but, but Susan, does that, does that mean that you are only going to be advertising hard, sort of very functional advertising with, with sort of this is what the product does, this is why it's worth it, rather than emotional so how do you push your clients yeah. to go beyond just that I stuff? Don't, I don't think so at all. I want to pick up on something that was said earlier about you having to do a question about when you're doing price or promotion and how do you uh, make sure you're not eroding the brand or that it's a, I think um, more and more for all sorts of reasons more and more of the marketing is in a positive way being integrated and it's much more cohesive so I think it's much more of a, of a much more unusual if there's a promotion or any tactic that's not tied to the overall brand building. So I, I don't see too much promotion or one-off kind of communications that's not tied to a part of a, a much more integrated marketing program. So I think there are very rare instances when it's a one-off. But I think what uh, advertisers are getting much, much better at, I think Procter & Gamble, one of our largest clients is Masterful of this, is, is value reframing. So rather than doing just kind of price one-offs, they're looking at what, how can we uh, get our consumers, our target, to uh, think about the value that we're offering in a different frame. So uh, Olay uh, positioned itself, the, the new frame was Olay versus a facelift. So you know you immediately change that, so to make it or for bounty paper towels, something as, as commodity-like as paper towels, it, the value reframing was all about basically that you can, um, the multi-uses of a, and the absorbency of that paper towel versus the cheap ones where you literally have to go through 40 uh, to do the same job as a single one. So value, people are getting, you know, expert at value reframing. So I don't see too much wasted dollars on just um, price off <coughs> or one-offs. Peter, what do you think of that? No, I think, I think building the brand and driving demand are mutually inclusive, I agree. And then we've been sm we're smarter now at you know, putting a deposit in the brand bank and the bank. Um, you, know, you asked Mike about Walmart. Not that Mike's job's easy, it's far from easy. 
But Walmart's <laughs> always stood for everyday low prices. Mm. So the bigger question is when you have other clients that didn't, yeah. that are asking you to do price advertising. And I've never had a client ask me to do price advertising that then didn't cut my pricing. So right. it's bad for Shadow. <laughs> but, um, and I think pr you know, price is a losing battle because once you train people to shop on price alone, even when we get on the other side of the recession, you can't get out of that spiral. Um, so for clients like, you know, we do Maybelline, we've been reframing value, I think that's well put, um, and selling premium you know, mascara in a downturn economy by leveraging the innovation and the benefits. Yeah. And people just think there are beauty benefits that are worth the premium. Yeah. In the case of a Fresh Direct, we do you know, uh, seven day week delivery or on time guarantees. We don't discount the food and we do leverage the fact it's direct to begin with so there's no middleman. Um, you know, we're doing some work with hotels where they've been giving away night after night after night and their, their nights are down and their revenue is twice as down as their nights because they've been giving it away. Yeah. So we've been working on auctions and guarantees and trying to get pe heads in beds but not completely discounting your brand and driving your revenue into the toilet. So, so. so uh, does anybody have uh, some answers for this quite If you have a client who is, uh, has been advertising on, on price and has been focused on value, looking to the other side of the recession, how, how do you, does anybody have any good ideas for how you get them out of that and back <coughs> into, into growth, away from that value message. I have, I have one example so, for, um, our largest client is in the QSR industry, at Sonic Drive-Ins. And, you know, when the recession started, <coughs> that's the good news because people are trading down in the restaurant habits. The bad news is we're the highest price within QSR. So there were things on the ground level we had to do more for, to talk about price and value from a menu strategy standpoint to get ourselves in line. But in terms of what we're doing with our advertising, our marketing to the consumer, um, our focus right now is on how do, we, how do we drive that traffic to gain share but also create loyalty so that after the recession we've protected our client base. Mm -hmm. We're not letting people churn. So a program that, that we've introduced that, that they've invested heavily in is a cause marketing program called Limeades for Learning. Uh, beverage sales, fountain drinks is a, is a huge percentage of their business. And so we've tied a whole cause marketing effort around education and, and local community schools and teachers um, mm -hmm. that they're actually investing in their brand in that way with the component that it drives drink sales. So it's been really a, a, a very mutual, mutually beneficial thing for them and their community um, in terms of driving traffic, driving sales, but also giving back. Susan, what do you say? I think uh, marketing today is a Marketing is really a, a conversation, and we're at a we're at a point in that conversation where a lot of that conversation today is about value. And I think as the consumer kind of moves out of, or maybe even becomes a little tired of that the singularity of that message, we just need to stay in touch with that consumer and move them along. So nothing, if anything, kind of exists in isolation these days. It's it's fleeting. It's it's really transitory, which is which is wasted money, uh, in my opinion. So we need to think about whatever the, a good price can be a terrific instigator of some action, but we need to right away anticipate where do they go next and what's going to be, how do we take that uh, interest and make sure we're delivering on a total brand experience, make sure the product is fulfilling against the benefits, and then go along that conversation journey with the consumer. So, so Bob, what's the best way to get out ahead of, of where, or where the conversation is going next? Is you, do you just wait for people to stop talking about value until the value stuff doesn't work anymore? No, I think you have to, uh, I, I think again, listening to what the you know, consumer sentiment really is about the brand is probably the most important thing. And, and obviously the web has allowed lots of you know, cultural anthropology, digital anthropology, listening to conversations. You, know, you saw it yesterday, Microsoft has the new Looking Glass platform that's pulling a lot, of, you know, a lot of contextual data out, that you can really understand what's being said about a brand very, very easily. And, and, and there are tools mm -hmm. out, out there that you can use to anticipate what the, yeah. the um, appetite is for that brand, positively and negatively. So you can use that as the you know, predictor, <coughs> if you will, of, of where the, the trend is going and what the direction is of that brand and the product, and then adjust your, your marketing messages and your advertising messages, messages to 
to anticipate that and inter intercept it, and therefore you'll have an opportunity to, to take advantage of it. I, yeah, I think one of the, um, maybe it's just in a deep coma, but I think brand advertising, pure brand advertising is dead right now. I mean, I think we have to, we create brands while we're building the sales. Uh, and um, if you do, I don't have any clients coming to me and saying, here's, a, here's the brand advertising budget. Um, we build brand while we build sales. And um, our GEICO work is measured by how many phone calls and clicks it gets. And, um, if, and we've run campaigns that didn't get those phone calls and clicks, and so they're over overnight. They don't, um, most of you probably know about cavemen and lizards, but you probably don't remember the flying monkeys that we had years ago, because that lasted two days because the phone stopped ringing, and, um, <laughs> and, and we killed it overnight. I and thought so monkeys would resonate. <laughs> <laughs> flying monkeys were how they saved you that money. <laughs> and um, and uh, uh, so we killed that campaign because it didn't get results. Geico now has one of the strongest brands in its industry, and we've never done a brand See, I, I agree. I, I, if I can, I think yeah. that it's. I, I think that our job as agencies is always. I, the term value is what we do. We create value for our clients. So we got to be careful not to equate the word value simply to price. And I think your Geico example is is awesome. I mean, you've created a campaign that that obviously is measured on on clicks and phone calls. Yet you've done an outstanding job of building the brand. And I think that the responsibility on us is how do we grow our clients business while simultaneously building the brand not how do we do one sometimes and the other other times well i'll return the compliment because i think your sonic stuff <laughs> does that same thing i mean Thank i you. think every, every commercial is involving and entertaining whether or not i have one day special well and, but which is like also included Always. But if we don't sell that special, yeah. then right. If I can interrupt this love fest right here. <laughs> and ask We're that. <laughs> I mean, this what you said here is pretty interesting. That that, that brand advertising is dead. That it has to be a, a it has to be a, 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 a an ad that drives sales and does brand on the on the on the side. Peter, do you think one? Do you think that's that's true right now? Do you think that's always going to be? The case. So I think brand and demand are mutually inclusive. Yeah. And I think it's been that way for a while. And I think if you're doing an effective job, you're you're always depositing in the brand bank and driving sales. Um, I, I think pure brand advertising was always a luxury, and I think it may now be extinct forever. But if I, I just want to say one thing on the price yeah. thing. And you said, how do we get clients out of that? One thing we did, and I'm not saying that this is the silver bullet, but we had a tracking study for one of our clients. And they felt that their sales were driven by price, quality, and service. And we had a tracking study, and they, they made us run a lot more price advertising. And the tracking study came back that our quality perceptions dipped yeah. mm -hmm. when we hammered away at price. So then no one bought us on quality. <laughs> the price was good. Yeah. Then when we went heavy on quality, our price perceptions went through the roof, and no one bought us on price. Mm -hmm. So you know, that's a whole circular thing you can get into for years and years and years. But the point is, I think it's a balance of everything. And this value reframing, I think, is, is very, very well put. And I think, by the way, as an industry, we need to do it for ourselves, because I don't even think we price ourselves correctly and value ourselves correctly and frame ourselves correctly yeah. to our clients. Well, Susan, how, do you, how do you strike that balance without getting so lost in the data th th that you can't still be coming up with creative ideas? Well, I, I actually want to go jump back to this you, whole idea of okay. pure advertising. Yeah. Is, is pure advertising. I think what you mean, I think what you mean by pure advertising is, is advertising that exists in a vacuum or siloed or segmented out or discrete. One of the biggest changes I think we've seen is the rediscovery in a very positive way of integrated marketing. For years and years and years, we talked about the importance, the advertising side uh, or the uh, agency side would talk about the importance of integrating, but they meant integrating a campaign. The good news, I think, whether it's driven by the need for uh, simplification, whether it's efficiency, or whether it's the importance of the singularity of impact, clients, clients have finally begun to break down the silos mm -hmm. inside their organization. So you see these brand building uh, groups as opposed to advertising versus media versus digital versus so things are really coming together so that um, 
advertising, what, what we thought of as pure brand advertising, is viewed in the context of what role is it playing? Mm -hmm. Is it framing? Is it instigating? Yeah. Is it accelerating? Versus what role is the digital component playing? So I think finally, and it's one of the best news, news for me of, for the, of the recession, is that clients are breaking down those silos and those barriers to enable us to finally really integrate um, marketing, not just do an integrated campaign, but integrate marketing. So how do you, uh, when clients are doing that and, and, and breaking apart those, those silos, that's great. Are there ways to, when you are, when you do have a client when the, the, that is still extremely <laughs> balkanized in its mm -hmm. departments, how do you get around that? Or if you're one of, of several agencies that work for the client, how do you, how do you make sure that, that, that brand is driving demand and that there is that cohesive connection. Uh, Jeff, well, well, being the, the token independent uh, panelist, we, the, the, the di different service disciplines are in-house for us. Mm -hmm. So we're not working with partner agencies like a holding company may. And so in, in the case you're describing, it's pretty simple. We become the integrator. Yeah. And the, the type and size of clients that we tend to work with um, tend to have smaller marketing departments. Um, sometimes they're more integrated than others. Often they're very departmentalized. Um, the key one that, that we still see compartmentalized that I think is a mistake and we see the trend moving is public relations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your corporate communications group being separate from your marketing group we think is a huge mistake. Yeah. And we have the PR discipline within the mm -hmm. agency so oftentimes we become the integrator of those functions for yeah. our clients both on the PR side and that other thing we said we weren't going to talk about. Mm -hmm. I, well, I, think, um, I think that's a huge point. I think it, it, corporations make a big mistake because they think of PR first often as um, a Wall Street relations and, yeah. and so the public relations becomes yeah. about that. When really I think our industry needs, the old fashioned word for it was product publicity, you know, to help our, our campaigns do their job. It, that should be blended in. And if, if they want to have their separate um, corporate relations PR department, that's fine. Uh, and I want to ask you, Susan, in particular about this. You, uh, Publicis does work with City, yeah. um, which and, and I wanted to ask you about City too when we were talking about pure brand versus demand. That's a brand that there, there's a lot of public ire against yeah. that brand and brand like it. Um, so. How do you negotiate that the division between corporate communications and marketing yeah, and a, that's a huge, brand and demand? That's a huge issue, not just for city. Um, one of the uh, one of the effects of the uh, recession, I guess, uh, is that the there's been a dramatic erosion in trust for business. There's something like saw a recent uh, poll: forty four percent of only 44 44% per of people have uh, distrust business. That's down from I think. Uh, 58% in just two mm -hmm. years, that's right. and uh, that's a pretty dramatic difference. Uh, down on the bottom, you have uh, financial services and automotive, but, the, but the, uh, the trust issue with both of those is very, very different. In the case of automotive industry, people are really just, for years and years and years, their, their uh, lack of, of, of trust of those is, comes from being disappointed year after year, whereas for the automotive, for the financial services, financial services companies have been vilified. They really have. And for uh, for to communicate, uh, there are two things that I'm seeing happening, and it's certainly true for City. You have to rebuild that trust, be incredibly transparent. Uh, kind of humility has been rediscovered as a virtue. I mean, you can't, there's no going out there and breastfeeding is just you know kind of useless. And so there are two things. One is you have to be out there. Uh, becoming relevant by advertising and communicating about the really good, helpful services you have. So one of the things we're doing is we're, we're very, very simple for the retail bank. We're talking about things like identity theft, uh, cash back, alerts on your, uh, your checking account, very, how these fit in to helping you. And it's going to take a while, but you talk about things that are very, very true, honest, and you can deliver. On the other side of it, you have to uh, you know, talk about PR you have to engage in uh, influencer marketing, I guess, for lack of a better word, where you've mm -hmm. got to go out and talk about the people who are really um, p uh, the ones who are framing the conversation around city. And the leadership of, of city has to, and they are, get, it, get out there and have those transparent town hall meetings 
conversations while at the same time uh, being clear about what they want to stand for. And it can't be some kind of fluffy, you know, aspirational, uh, hyperbolic um, concept. It has to be, it has to really ring true to people. And that will take several years. And what are the kinds of things you look at in terms of, of what, what sorts of brand perception measures are you trying to move uh, with a brand like that? Well, trust would certainly trust. be, and credibility. Mm -hmm. You know, really simple, basic. Do you, do, you, do you have any faith in this organization? Again, I think automotive is in uh, much the same kind mm -hmm. of a... A situation. Bob, yeah, we, we, we do a lot of work with Toyota and the same same issue. Toyota was never in the business of discounting cars until obviously probably about a year ago when everything else, everything else <laughs> went down the tubes. But um, yeah, they were about um, quality, reliability, and, and service, right? So they were they were looking at what those those values are now. It was. Re refocusing on is it dependability, is it the reliability, is it the safety, is it the styling? You know, what are the things that you can get people's heads around that are looking at that brand differently because the credibility isn't there. Um, it's it's a it's a need that you just have to reframe into a into a new conversation with them that they can emotionally connect to and say, okay, I'm I'm thinking about this car and this automotive um, brand in a different way. One of the things that I think <coughs> I've, I've learned from Walmart is um, they, they, the, the opinion of Walmart was so incredibly low. Here I am, a bleeding heart liberal working on Walmart, and my family can't believe it. But what, <laughs> but what half they money. did, what they did was they changed a lot of their practices. So they, um, they became serious about sustainability. It's not, that's what, it started out, Problem. Well, Lee Scott says it started out as a PR gesture, but what it became was real and part of their religion. 92% of the 1.8 million Walmart employees have health insurance coverage now. And so what Walmart did is they made real changes. And so it's not part of the job of, that we have is speaking that truth to power to say, well, you have to make these changes, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it used to be that heads of corporations were so defensive as soon as they were attacked. And we watched the cigarette industry go through that. They were so defensive for so many years they became villains. And so um, uh, that's always a temptation. Um, Walmart didn't understand at first. Why, why do people hate us? We've been doing the same thing about trying to keep our prices low all these years. But then they said, well, the scale makes a difference. Now that we're big, everybody sees us, and we, ha we have to be a better corporate citizen. And that's what they did. Mm -hmm. And so we don't do ads about that, but people are catching on to that. Mm -hmm. They know that. So in your role, um, when you said you didn't do ads about that, so what, what was your role in, in helping shift that, that perception uh, with Walmart? We became very aware of it so that when we were doing ads for some products, for example, that where um, sustainability could be part of the story. Um, we still, every product they sell, we sell on the basis of uh, you'll get more for your money at, at uh, Walmart. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we did two things. The, for example, the sustainability ads, we had people talking about how they bought this light bulb and if all 180 million or 200 million of us Walmart shoppers did that, it's going to make a big difference in the world. So Walmart didn't take credit. We gave it to their customers to make mm. the difference. But we still said we'd give you the best price on that, on that light bulb. And, and, and so we did that. And um, the second thing we did was bring back an old quote from Sam Walton about uh, we help people save money so they can live better. Mm -hmm. and, and that became that too is religion in Bentonville now. Mm -hmm. You know, I think this concept of, uh, you didn't call it this, but uh, the notion of uh, a higher order purpose, mm -hmm. I think we're going to be hearing lots and lots yes. more about that because more and more you have to think about for your brand, what is the higher order purpose that your brand mm -hmm. uh, serves? Is it like for Proctor, it's, it's touching lives, improving yeah. life. You know, having that kind of higher order purpose for your brand, I think it's what got Pampers in among like the top mm. 50 brands because they had a yeah. higher or the purpose because today in the, it, because of in this world of co-creation and conversation advocacy trumps awareness mm. I and mean, what you really are trying to do <coughs> is you're trying to create 
advocacy for your brand and, and influence the conversation so that people, it's not just communicating and telling, it's our job is to help, again, stimulate, instigate, channel a communication to the advantage of our, our conversation to the advantage of our brand so that we create advocacy as opposed <laughs> to just generate awareness. So that's kind of the new. I, I think. Go ahead, Joe. I, 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 I want to jump on that point. I think, I think advocacy is a, is a great word to put on this, and, and I think in the example of Walmart, what you've done is a great job of reflecting real changes they've made in their corporation accurately, getting them credit for the things that they have inherently done. I mentioned um, a program we're doing with Sonic. Um, cause marketing is a way to create that mm -hmm. in a real way. So if, if you're not Walmart in their sustainability efforts, there are ways to adopt things that create that advocacy for your client. Um, Lee Jeans came to us 13 years ago and asked us how to sell more jeans and the program that we came back to them with was Lee National Denim Day, which is now in its 13th or 14th year and that's all about giving back and it's about creating advocates out of women. So I want to go to questions in the audience very soon, um, so it looks like we've got questions right here. Before we do, I just, we talk about this, this higher, market, <coughs> higher purpose marketing, advocacy, at a time when trust in business is so low, Peter, is anybody, do you think people are really going to buy that, that, the, that businesses have a higher purpose other than no, I think, you make know, money? How do you do that the right way? I think one of the things we're realizing as advertising people in reframing advertising, a lot of what I've found in this recession is clients come to us with business problems, not necessarily brand problems. Mm -hmm. and, and what is a business problem, what is a brand, and where does one end, and where does one begin? Yeah. And, and um, you know, in the case of Citi, they had systemic business issues, yeah. not necessarily easily solved by advertising. Mm -hmm. And unless you're in lockstep with your client, and unless you're the client's consigliere, and immersed in their business, and guiding them on how to make business decisions, you don't want to do advertising, you know, good advertising can kill bad business quickly. Um, practices. So I think, um, you know, in our industry, we need to be um, reshaping the value we add, and we need to be having a different dialogue with our clients on, on business-related issues that then can turn into really smart communications, mm -hmm. so that we can build the brand and build the business. I think so that's a huge point. I, I mean, in terms of one of the major changes, which I hope is sustained yeah, as we become much more brand advi advisors, objective advisors to our clients as opposed to ad people or digital people or media yeah. people. What we have that's um, close to unique is that there are creative companies like Disney and architecture firms that don't have the strategic um, uh, uh, departments and the strategic expertise of the best um, marketing and advertising firms. Mm -hmm. We have the strategic thing along with the creative that Boston Consulting and McKinsey don't have. Mm -hmm. And so we, we should be able to apply those strategic and creative skills in ways that go beyond just what is the next ad campaign. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, so we've got, I can see a question right there and there's a microphones are circulating around. Okay, can you hear me? We can yes. hear you, yes. I don't know if that's. No. <laughs> can hear you anyway. <laughs> I'm going to ask a question and then I'm going to add a couple comments to the question. And um, the question is, what can traditional media, magazines specifically, do better today to evolve and um, gain greater traction and success in the multimedia space? Great. My comments are, uh, today business the Wall Street guy, Journal. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to add some. I'm going to add some not color to this. In trouble. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to add some color to um, some comments to this. Today in the Wall Street Journal, there was an article that said it's Ad Week. Where are magazines? Where is TV? The Ad Week has been focused on digital. I work for a magazine. I'm publisher of a magazine that's um, been around a hundred years, and. We're having one of our best years ever because we've been able to evolve and take. What magazine is that? Uh, Audubon Magazine, National Audubon oh. Society. We're a niche publication. We've developed multi platform programs. We have an iPhone application coming out. We have a great website. Our biggest challenge is the negativity of the magazine industry, not our product, but going into agencies and getting attention 
and being able to make a sales call and show all the great value we have to offer. But the industry is not here. This room is a third empty. There are five CEOs, six CEOs here, and no one's here. It's sad. It's, it's really not good for the industry. I was feeling good. We don't have that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. So my question is, back to my question. Uh, I'm getting emotional here. My question is, what can the traditional magazines do better to get into senior people at agencies and clients and, and sell their value? Who wants to answer that? I had uh, one quick, which stop thinking of yourself as a magazine. Yeah, right. I mean, I think when, uh, in, in the magazine's heydays, they thought about themselves as providing entertaining, meaningful content to a specific target audience, which, by the way, doesn't have to be lim limited to the format of a magazine. I'd say really rethink the business that you're in, and it's not the magazine business. Bob? Yeah, I, I, t this is the guy who doesn't do any work for magazines. But if you use a corollary, um, <coughs> Travel Channel, which, which we've done a lot of work with, similar, similar challenge, if you will. Um, how did they, they wanted to get more involvement from the 18 to 34 year old crowd. Um, and it was a combination of a, a social media, web driven to the website to watch the TV. Um, I think you have to do that integrated type of look at how, who, who are the people who you want to attract and how do you get to them in a very different way to drive them in addition to the magazine to some other, um, some other platform that they can participate in. Let's get another question. Uh, Jill's right there and then. Uh, I'm just curious if you all genuinely believe that you have uh, the right people internally um, as part of your staffs to actually service your clients in the way you're describing that they want to be serviced in terms of a strategic value. Uh, I can start with that. Um, you know, I don't think you ever have the staff, the ideal staff that you need and want. Um, but one of the things this recession has done is I think it's forced us to be, to make h some hard decisions, look at our business model, I think be a little bit leaner and a little bit meaner. Um, but there's been also other I think not so good consequences. I think you know a lot more people are freelancing, and um, and a lot more things are subcontracted out. But as as the world changes and the communications landscape changes, um, you know agencies really really need to evolve. And I think they were slow to evolve, and this recession has really forced them to evolve much greater than they would have. So I think we'll come out of this stronger, better. And I think actually um, creativity is more paramount than ever. Um, to not s to sell ourselves in a competitive environment, but also with the emergence of social media, you're not going to socialize something that's not creative that you don't like. But um, to answer your direct question, I don't I don't think um, you know I think we have to. Our industry has been hit by the recession pretty hard, so I think we've had to be very resourceful, and we've had to push on a lot of people. At least my agency's had to push on a lot of people in a lot of departments to do a lot more things outside of their comfort level. So. Um, and resourceful is not necessarily a bad thing. But to get the job done, you can always, you can always freelance it or subcontract it out, or you can ask more of your existing people and force them to evolve. Um, because I don't think there are departments. You know, we talk about the digital department. The second you call it a department, you don't understand digital. Right. It's just the way, you know, it's the air we breathe. It's the, it's the way of the world. So, um, you know, what we've done at my agency is I think more people are more generalists. Um, because we've been forced to do that. I don't think we have anywhere near enough minorities um, to speak to the world as the world exists today. And, uh, at least my agency and most agencies I know. I think it, I think it is a problem that we haven't um, uh, built that from the ground up. Um, so I, I think that's a huge shortage for our industry and for my company. And I think that um, um, this there has never, there has never been a better time to hire people yeah. uh, than right now. Um, and so if you have holes in your staff, you know, there's never been tighter money either. But, if you, um, but this is the time to look at that very question. Do we have what it takes to go forward? Mm -hmm. I love stretching people into new areas. We all do. And, um, and so I think we can get the, um, the staff we need right now I would love to pick up some of the, not too many of them, but some of those smart Wall Street 
people who are saying maybe they won't go back to Wall Street and maybe they'll come to our industry because the other area that most of our agencies are hurting in is we've made the account management job the least attractive job, mm. a key job in the agency. And so we've fallen behind other industries in having that ki the kind of leadership mm. we want and need in account management. I think we're doing well in strategy. I think we're doing well in creative. But I think we need the minorities, and I think we need the um, account leadership. Right there. Uh, Susan, you talked about the uh, research that um, trust is way down uh, in terms of um, what people think about businesses. I was reading a, uh, a Wire story yesterday that trust is also down dramatically in terms of how people perceive the news media. And maybe that's a function of cable networks being so opinionated. But I'd like to you know, throw it out to the panel. Uh, if the medium is the message, how it, when, when you decide what your message is, are you changing your strategy in terms of where to put that message in terms of, <laughs> of your media selection so that your message is believed and trusted more? Yeah, I, I think the issue of um, the overall news media is very, very interesting because what is news versus entertainment? Is news entertainment? There's such a, an interesting blur there. But I think the real issue that with news uh, has to do with, and, and how it's changed so much, has to do with the authority of news. And where does the authority come from and, and the source of authority? <coughs> we live in an age where people don't know how to evaluate the authority of information. I mean, look at Wikipedia. You know, something you hear or read, uh, you know, almost anywhere on the web can be as authoritative and viewed as, more, as, author more, as authoritative as something you hear in the news media. People are very suspicious of anything that's prepackaged. I think that's one of the appeals of the reality shows. It's like, you know, you tear away, you split, you look down at that naked self and you say, okay, that's the real thing. And people think news, uh, today's news has been packaged and prepackaged and they're skeptical about it. So I think it's a, an issue of what is authoritative and where does a message get authority that we need to address as a, and that's the fundamental problem of the news media, I believe. We've got time for one more question. Susan, you mentioned uh, something earlier with regard to integrated marketing, and I feel like I feel like integrated marketing in the way to view now is really focused on traditional media and digital. But my question is with regard to live events, and if you feel like your clients have come to you when they look at integrated marketing for live events, and if they have, how are you guys as agencies equipped to provide those experiences of live event integration to your clients? I'll jump in on that. But, um, I think we t now take a broader range of ideas to clients than ever before. Mm -hmm. The fact is most of our client organizations aren't equipped to handle a broad range of things. And so, um, you, you know, what we often hear about ad agencies is they're focused on old media or something like that. Well, no, it, we t we're taking the digital ideas, the event ideas, the in-store ideas, and our clients typically aren't structured to handle those things. And so they say, oh, we love this, we love this, we love this. Let's start with the TV and print, um, and we'll get to this other stuff later, and later never comes, because they don't have anybody in their department um, that does that, or else they think it's somebody else's department's job. And so there are companies that are better at that. And, um, if Bob Greenberg was from RGA was here, he would say, all oh, your clients want what I'm offering. And <laughs> of course all would. his <laughs> clients want what he's offering. My <laughs> clients aren't asking for that right now. And so I, think, um, uh, so I think we're leading our clients in most cases, at least I think the best agencies are. But, and we can put together the teams, um, whether they are partner agencies or whether they are different kinds of companies, when we need specific expertise that we don't have on staff. But I, I think it comes down to, you know, the physical and the digital world is kind of intertwined and you're going to promote a physical event digitally and vice versa. But it starts with the idea, first and foremost, and if the idea is rooted in the brand, then there's a task you have to do. And if event makes a sense to build the band, brand and drive demand, you get the event done. But back to Susan's point a long, long time. Gone are the days of one-off things that are not sought, thought through, that are not tied to a brand and not integrated. So, you know, could you get a one-off event done? Yeah. 
Should it be tied to a brand idea that drives demand um, as part of an integrated program off of, you know, a sustaining platform? Yeah. And, um, but I take your point because we have a lot of general clients and I think the walls are breaking down on the client side, which is a good result of the recession. So a lot of our clients are, have a broader horizon than they did and their silos are being broken down. So they have a greater appetite and a greater sense of responsibility to take on that event. You're hearing less and less like, that's not my department, yeah, or I don't understand it. If it makes sense for the brand, let's do it. It comes back full circle. The biggest challenge, it's a challenge for, I'm going to say in social media <coughs> also, is um, that the um, point of entry is, is pretty easy at that point. You know, but the big question clients have is the ROI. And they, I actually think they're getting more enlightened about that because they're starting to think about things like return on contagion as opposed to just return on you know, how much does it how much conversation does it spark where does it go how does it get magnified <coughs> so I think we're going to see more interest in those kinds of things tied to brand building with a different kind of way to measure it like like our return on contagion as opposed to ROI but today they don't know how to it was a great event but was it scalable you know where can I take it and what did it really do for my business that's been a huge challenge for us as well in producing live events is for our sponsors or our partners delivering that ROI and why we feel like kind of moving forward in 2010, as I think it was, Peter, you mentioned it needs to be part of a 365 day a year campaign where the brand can actually leverage the property in a much greater way. I think we look at, we look Final at- Final thoughts, Mark. Okay. Just uh, time. We look at integration a little differently. If, if you think about, forget about digital, social, all the, all the labels we put on channels, and think about it, in a, I think we overcomplicate it. Think about it in a much more simplistic term. There's paid media, and there's earned media. And a big growing part of our industry is, is earned media. And the way you measure those two things yeah. are entirely different, to your point, Susan. So the way, it, it, ROI makes sense for paid media. I've invested money in this. What, what's my return? Earned media is entirely different. And I think it's our responsibility as, as agencies and stewards of our clients' brands to help them understand how, how to look at those programs yeah, better to, to understand whether or not they're working. Great. Well, if we can give our panelists a round of applause.